It's insane to think that somehow all this started with a rather dull conversation about economics with Godbert and Lolo Rito. Don't exclude Hancock. He, he, he contributed <laughs> greatly to the exuberance of political discussion. He was actually rather timid compared to his 4.0 pontification <laughs> yeah i do kind of wonder if they received some reviews and toned down the hancock a bit because he was a little quiet in comparison he still had a lot to say yeah i honestly i had no issues with hancock this time around in 4.1 and onward because he uh, barely said anything which is my favorite version of hancock the one where he doesn't talk much but oh my god dude sitting here at the end of stormblood thinking about 4.1 through 4.3 I barely remember my thoughts about 4.1. It's like this, it wasn't even that far back that we played it, but it's this distant memory of me feeling a little bored, if I'm being honest. Like in the moment, there, there was a lot of hype for Stormblood patch content and 4.1 opens pretty slow. And it's got some like really serious, for me, really serious shades of a realm or born. Probably just cause I'm like listening to Nanamo talk to another Falafel who I don't trust. It's a false piece, right? We needed this slowness to enjoy Xenos' death. Xenos' eh. death, right? Without that lull with Arn Vald and going around the Salterly, we wouldn't have had that feeling of peace upon us, that this was a world that we had defended, that things are going to be okay for a little bit. And with the passage of time, you know, this is three months between each patch. So there would have been a call back to the game after your big thrilling conclusion, perhaps a chance for you to resub and start experiencing that story again, ease into it a little bit. There, there were asides throughout all of this that I think worked really well. They were slower, but they're purposeful to just maybe give your brain a break from the drama and trauma that you might be experiencing with this story as it goes, such as the yabby jaw. Who's the, I guess they came up with a cute little mini game, but locating the weak point on the Yabby was insane. And the hardest thing I've done in this game. It was another moment where I was like, why are people so stoked for us to get to Stormblood patches? Like, I, I was fine with it. it. It's just, it was a really funny dichotomy with the hype going in of, of me just being like, I'm playing the right <laughs> stuff, right? <laughs> this, 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 is this what you love? I, I'm, this, I'm concerned. This is what you, there's, not, there's not even any thirstiness here. It, in in retrospect, it, it all really worked, and I love where 4.1 goes. Like, by the end of it, I really enjoyed the character pieces along the way. And uh, thanks to you, I really enjoyed uh, some of the other beats that, had I not been experiencing this with you, and you keeping tabs on things that you find interesting, it may have washed over me. Not to get too ahead of ourselves with sitting there and talking about job prospects for refugees with Lolo Rito, we gotta talk about the Drowned City. This was such a great aside. Arn Vald is such a heartfelt character. I love when Final Fantasy XIV goes back to its adventurer roots, to a simpler time, when we weren't a warrior of light or the chosen one and all those sorts of things. We just did adventures because they were fun or for riches. And Arnvald, our B-plot, you know, the, the character that would be us if we didn't exist. It's just fun to hang out with, and he suggested a rather fantastic Indiana Jones adventure. He did, yeah. We, we, we get, there's a little bit of a, it, you know, if you're one of those folks that don't like the, the MMO-y, like, talk to this person type quests, this, you know, may have rubbed you the wrong way, but we have a few of those that kind of talk up this drowned city where horrible fates befell people that got on the bad side of the Mad King. And I think we were both really excited to go to it. And yeah, you know, we'll get we'll get into this in the Wall of Dungeons, but the dungeon itself I think looks amazing. I really like the whole look of the place. The monsters didn't quite do it for me. I, I thought the lead up was more exciting than actually seeing the Drowned City. The Drowned City in storyline had a chance to be really messed up. And the monsters were just kind of, eh. Maybe they were saving all the messed up for 4.3 and down the road. Maybe this would have been different, though. So they could have really, like, really pushed for, like, you know, haunted house, uh, resurrected dead vibe. And it was a little, it was a little straightforward in the monsters. But uh, I digress. I, I like this a little bit. It's a fun little aside. It's an interesting way to, you know, add a little bit of action, add a little bit of adventuring 
to this plot of 4.1 of, of the plight of the refugees. Final Fantasy XIV just gets its hands in the dirt and stares the outcome of a successful war right in the face. And it's like, all right, what do you have to do now? Well, you've got all these people. you got to worry about them. Well, you've got all these interested political parties. You also have to worry about them. And you need to scratch certain people's backs so that they actually want to help the refugees. And it's super nuanced and an oddly realistic, while still, I would say, optimistic depiction of what the aftermath of a war like this could be like. It's a balancing act, right? Because the world could very easily go full fantasy crystal tech and just for Dola's in a super magic prison where she doesn't age or something and she's in suspension and we can forget about her for three expansions. And over here, the Garleans are building super lasers that they harvested from the moon or everything is very grounded and has this process to it. In fact, outside of the warrior lights, echo explorations and growth, we haven't had extreme power escalation. It's still just primals and Asians, and we explore their existing powers and maybe what they choose to unleash on us. But at this current point, when someone goes to jail, they go to normal people jail. They go down in a dungeon and they sit there and you don't give them weapons and they can't get out. And that allows this process of talking through war and the punishments and the people being mad at Fordola enough to want to go in there and kill her and rob on speech to calm them down. A realistic proposition. Meanwhile, while there's, you know, floating fairies outside and someone shooting rocks with laser beams around you to heal you, it, it all kind of works. And that really comes back to this balance. Like, there are extremely messed up moments in this patch content. And then there's extremely wacky moments. But that's the balance they strike. Yeah, balance is a really good way to put it. And I think we're going to keep coming back to that as we talk through this. But I stand by what I said in the opening. Like, it is slow, but slow doesn't always mean bad. Like, I, I want I want to be clear about that. When I say something slow, I don't mean it's bad. It's it just like in this case, it was interesting because this is the foot you start off on with the Stormblood patch content and the patch content was really hyped for us. I really enjoyed 4.1 and I really liked everything, like the, the these nuanced challenges of what we do, like, how do you build Alamigo back after liberation? And I really like when it all comes to a head with the meeting in the throne room, like the, and I really like the moment right before, I guess I would say the primals hit the fan where Lisa invites all of the various leaders of like different tribes and sects to meet as equals in the throne room. And also damn Final Fantasy 14 does a really good job at giving you your victory you get to the end like the the first set of credits for any expansion or even you know the original realm reborn and you feel like yeah you close the book on a chapter and it feels satisfying it doesn't just feel like a vessel to simply just set up the next thing that's coming down the pipeline it feels like the end of a chapter even though there is plenty more to explore afterwards but this felt like an extension of the victory at the end of 4.0 because we just get to see the Alamegan banner hanging in its own damn throne room which I really liked I thought that was a nice touch on top of the fact that we get to see Lise really taking the lead on leadership of course then it kind of all blows up but that moment these quiet moments make the bombastic you know the rug being ripped out from under us more impactful it's such a fun game to pay attention to because you got the kalyana snake tribe who immediately here unleashes their god again lakshmi appears they hid crystals in the water they i guess they enthralled some of the guards which they enthralled guards, which then hid crystals in the water, which right. is how they got the water, the, like the crystals into the throne room. It, it suggests maybe there's like mini enthrallments you can do, like one-on-one -on -one enthrallments, but that's, that's kind of a side point here. I just love that we deal with this now. It was an opportunity to bring that story back in, and they did with ease and style very early on. Plus, it was a great opportunity to bring back in Fordola, using her echo powers and having Arnvold there and having this kind of echo buddy moment. This was the moment I was teasing, like it's cool that I get to experience this with you, but also like comments and just a community because I wasn't all that into the Kalyan. It felt like a massive fart off in our lead up to fighting Xenos. And I was just like, oh, oh, okay, okay. And whatever, if I was gonna sit here and be a little grumpier about it, I'm like, you could still shorten it. We didn't need to be that detail. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. All that's important is that it was important. 
and that there was a payoff here and what a payoff it was because this whole moment this throw down in the throne room this from a gameplay perspective if i'm you know i'm just gonna say it a duty that is infinitely better than the trial that precedes it with the same damn primal to fight it's a vessel for a really strong character beat with what happens with fordola coming in midway through the fight picking up a sword to defend the people of alamigo as opposed to oppress them i'm not gonna lie to you i didn't see it coming i was very surprised by that and i really liked it no i i had no idea where Lise was flipping off to and i didn't expect them to give her that redemption arc and make us really feel the plight of fordola and her discount echo powers it's it's faulty it's it, it, it can be helpful but it can also be a massive hindrance Right. I mean, I guess it's been a hindrance for us as well. We don't always get smacked with an echo flashback at the most opportune time. Yeah, I would have hung up on an echo in 4.3 if I that, could have. But, you know, you're, yeah, some you're trapped is- in there. You're experiencing their memories. And that's what Fordola's going with every day. Like everybody who passes by, she is connecting with. And what a punishment for being experimented on, being a part of the evil empire, being in Xenos' service. I mean, it's just... Who knows what's going to happen with her in the future? Obviously, she's not functional. Like, she can't. No. Even if she was like, hey, I'm I'm good now. Let's all be friends. Let's join the Scions. She can't. She's burdened with Echo. And it's a mix, too. She's also just burdened with her own reckoning of coming to terms with her worldview crashing down around her and, 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 and coming to terms with the fact that, like, she seems to be very aware of her wrongdoings at this point. You know, which doesn't happen with every single villain in this game. So it's like that plus this just empathy bomb of echoing all the damn time when when you're around people that you oppressed. Like, it's a lot, man. It's a lot. Like, it's a really interesting way to use the powers of the echo to use these things that could be like really silly magical powers within the world. But they take these powers and these rules that we understand. Even if you're like me and you like half remember some of this stuff. And they twist it, and they use it really well. And, and that's what I've, I think Fordola is a really good example of that. And yeah, I'm with you. I want to see more of Fordola. I, ho- I hope that she comes back in the future, because I think she'd just be really cool to adventure with. I'm a fan in all media of, of the villain-turned-ally, and I think Fordola would be a, uh, a really self-aware Vegeta, <laughs> which I would enjoy. Well, the other character moment that uh, well, 4.1 essentially ends on and I thought was moving and kind of adorable was everything with Raban and Nanamo. Yeah, wandering around with her in disguise was probably the low point of the expansion. There's, it's very slow, right? It's, yeah. it's very slow. We have a lot of we have a lot of meetings. Uh, at least we were a little more involved than, say, like the Realm Reborn table meetings where we're just getting <laughs> essentially the wolves pulled over our eyes by... Uh, was a Teleji, Adeleji. You know, you have a moment where you're sitting there with Lolo Rita with his with his mask off, by the way, with he has the coolest eyes. And he sounds like Mark Hamill Joker, but then he just wants to sit there and talk about the economic impact of (laughs) giving jobs to refugees. And I'm like, all right, listen, I appreciate the detail, but I'm not exactly riveted in this exact moment. Well, and that like he was explaining how a realm were born politics played into the taking of the Salterly so he can like, he's out there. He is galaxy braining the entire plot. Real Lex Luthor energy. And they, they hid those things back then. Like they're not retconning. I give them props for that, but they're just showing off at that point. <laughs> I'm just sitting back and watching them do flips and go, this, this is, this is vulgar. This is a vulgar display of lore. <laughs> well done. Well done. But it- but again, it paid off. We we, we get did. to know a different, we get to see a different side of Nanamo. And it also, it is a display of her ability to rule without Raubon at her side. Granted, we're there, but it's, I think it's more so that we, the actual player, can bear witness to Nanamo's capability more than it is that she really needed us as, as protection. It, it, it makes sense from a story standpoint. I don't want to, I don't want to, downplay that but it's another thing that because of where 4.1 ends you have this this slow burn moment with Nanamo that 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 has payoff and I like that it gives Pippin a place to go we have Raban moving on the son of Alamigo returns 
Pippin has a nice place as protector now. It gives him a role. Pippin and Robon are so grounded in reality. You know, they're part of this dungeon brick and mortar kind of world that Final Fantasy has, where Shadowbringers looks like it's building up to cosmic levels of something where they can't follow. So it's really nice to have those characters we love in nice little homes settled. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 just it's just nice. It, uh, I don't know. This is, with Robon, it like it, it hit me with themes of like emptiness parents. Like he's been this protector for so long, but he still has his own desires and things that he wants to do with his life. And in this case, it's looking back towards his homeland. And with Nanamo ready to just take the reins of Ulda by herself, with this protection that Raubon would clearly trust in Pippin, it's really cool. It's 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 a, it's a cool thing that in this big operatic epic fantasy, there's themes that remind me of real life. It's constantly rhyming with itself and in non-cheesy ways. You got Raubon being a father figure, but not really the father. Next to Gotsetsu being a father figure, but not really the father. And then you have the foster parents of the Brutuses, who aren't really the parent. Like, there is a overtone, and the music's even called a father's pride and throughout all this. There's this overtone of parenting of protection that the game hits really well. So when you move between these three very distinct stories, I mean, we can even work in Ferdola into that with her dad getting stoned in the streets. Like, holy shit. That was actually her dad in that case. Like we see this array of what upbringing and experience does to you in a world where pure emotions transform into monsters. Yeah, yeah. We also have like a, a, a like mirror opposite parent examples, right? With Fordola and her parents, but also Yatsuyu and hers. Like like Fordola had wonderful parents. They, you know, were Garlean sympathizers, which in a lesser game would just be like, and they're bad guys. No. They're good parents that died protecting their children or their child. Well, I guess the dad, right? The mom was still alive. Yeah, the mom lived to be disappointed that she tattooed her face. And yeah. And yeah. But then, like, we left 4.0 being like, man, Yatsuyu's m uh, mom, what a piece of work. But we find out later on that, yeah, it wasn't just the mom. You know, no. There's also some serious sins of the father going on. I, I think so much about how it, it took a village to raise a lease in. 4.0, like all of the leaders that she got to hang out with helped shape her into the leader that she became. But her ability, her willingness to give Fordola the benefit of the doubt and see if she can rehabilitate her and actually successfully get Fordola to put her life on the line for the people of Alamigo, it then is echoed later on with Hien taking a chance on Yatsuyu. And it's like, well, they shared a, a cell together. <laughs> like that is one of the leaders she quested alongside. And so it makes a lot of sense that her and Hien would make similar decisions with what to do with literal war criminals. Oh, and, and Ferdola's so weighed because of the room. We panned around that in a cut zine where Xenos was up there with the mad scientist and they were chatting and whatnot about the power and the, echo, the artificial echo and all that sort of thing. I did not gather at that time that all the little tents around and even the little, little tents being the Lollafell tents were all body bags. Like, Ferdola has a huge burden upon her. Like, she has to redeem, but also redeem everyone that possibly went in that machine. If she's even going to try to be good in any way. What a weight. Holy shit. That, that realization as we walked around that room was dark. This dichotomy in 4.1 of extremely grim realities with really optimistic and hopeful potential futures is... It's really, to me, that that's 4.1 through 4.3. Happens every single time. And 4.1 and 4.2 both end with teasers. And with that, let's talk about the characters that survived 4.0 that I was very excited to see again. So my favorite part of the opening of 4.2 was Totaru being livid at how much Alphano spent on Gosetsu's sword. <laughs> not only politics, it's the economic concerns, the scions that the writers are aware of. I bet you they have an actual checkbook. Like they are tracking to the gill how much money the scions have. One of those big ones that's in a binder where you have like six checks to a page. It's like a sheet Absolutely. of checks. You gotta, yeah. Every time Hori Boulder's in the back drinking, watching those funds, they're draining that account. And Tataru's gotta be the one to take care of it. <laughs> There's no day business. It's Tataru. Tataru is back there just like looking at the bartender like, yo, cut him off. 
He's done. But even like Sauron comes back for uh, just, you know, for fun. We like Sauron. It's nice to see you. But no, he's worked back in because he's building like a fairy enterprise that Tatara is going to invest in. And hey, more opportunity to rip on Alpha now. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, also, you know, sadly, more opportunity to have pirates tell us we need to pay a tithe. But, you know, those pirates, man, they're so cheeseball. They read in a book what it's like to be a pirate. They have Them no idea. Hancock, they, those two, the, the, the pirates of the Ruby Sea and Hancock, could, you could just they could be the star of a Final Fantasy spinoff called a game Garrett will never play. But all the services to get us moving towards Gotsetsu and Yatsuyu who are moving across the land we previously know. It's, it's kind of an opportunity to revisit our locations at this point after about six months since players would have finished up the original game. Yeah, yeah, they're out there having, you know, we, we were teased of their adventures, them out in Kugani, Gosetsu broke, Yatsuyu clearly not herself, but obsessed with Dongo, which I've never had, and now I need to have, after how many times it showed up in this damn game. Gosetsu is, at the moment, I don't know where he falls exactly, but he's a top three favorite character for me. I think my favorite character is Astinian still, but Gosetsu's right there. I love this character so much. I did think that if how we thought he went out in 4.0 was how Gosetsu went out, that it would essentially be perfect. You know, a sacrificial death to save his friends, to save Hien, to save his old master. But oh, I'm so glad he's not dead because what they did with him in the patch content of Stormblood, it's one of my favorite arcs of Final Fantasy XIV so far. They made me like something I cannot stand. Freaking amnesia plots. I can't stand amnesia plots, dude. They, they infuriate me. I think they're one of the most overplayed things on this earth. Can't stand it. Get him out of here. The second I hear, oh, I can't remember who I am. Suddenly I'm a good guy. I'm just like, Bruh! but again, really well executed here. It's a vessel. It's a it's a vessel for this theme of the fallout of war, of forgiving your enemies. Like, what do you do when you're the good guy with the upper hand now? What do you do once you have the power and you're, you're staring down pure freaking evil in Yatsuyu? They really spun gold out of this, I think. And maybe that's the redeeming quality of the amnesia is it poses that interesting question of what to do with her. Is she a product of her upbringing, Xenos' influence, the Garlean Empire? And this was an interesting exploration because it was alongside Gotsetsu, who was that lost father figure, having now had Hien leave the nest. Like, Hien is his own realized person, and Hien is amazing to follow. There are missteps throughout his political maneuvers that aren't bad. He plans for everything. He prepares properly. He plays the game to a T. When things go wrong, it wasn't because he just messed up whoops and contrivance for the plot. It's because something unique happened that was interesting. And the meeting between Gotsetsu and Hien, when Hien basically just forgives him for disappearing or for almost being dead, was so heart touching. I loved it. There was, yeah, no drama, right? There, there were so many points where I was watching this going, I think they're going to milk what I am witnessing for cheap conflict. And they right. kept taking the high road and avoiding it. That's yes. one really good example. But another one with Hien and with Gosetsu is Hien's decision. You know, this is jumping a little bit ahead, but he puts the sword to now Suyu's throat. And then comes to his own realization that he buys it, that he thinks she has truly forgotten who she is, and, and he decides, yeah, she, you know what? If her memories don't come back, she can stay with us. That was a big moment where I'm like, ah, oh, no, he ends, he ends good. They're going to drive a wedge between Gosetsu and Hien. Nope, they didn't. And like, I was just watching this like, yo, a lesser narrative would have just made Hien make the worst decision possible and gone down the drama road. Oh, it would have been a hammed up. It would have been a romantic comedy of misunderstandings and how nobody ever met the right point and someone like saw someone kissing someone else. Like it, it just, it was so nice to dodge all that. Granted, the game still did throw a red herring out there with Hien turning to be like, See Gotsetsu? He was acting kind of weird in there. And I'm like, oh, is he enthralled? Oh my God, what's going on with Gotsetsu? And it just ended up like, he was shot three times and doesn't feel great. <laughs> just gonna say that was on you, but I, I was like, I was like, he's tired. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wasn't buying that, buying that at all. But he's showing his age, like, and to he end, that's a very tender moment of like recognizing the years in Gotsetsu and seeing him in a different light. We got to talk about 
who I think might be the single best villain we've encountered in Final Fantasy XIV up until this point in Asahi. I have not hated a character in this game as much as I cannot stand Asahi. Simultaneously, I think he is a perfectly written villain. I thought he was a vessel for Shadowbringers, which he still may be. He comes in talking about the Populari and basically giving us a big lesson on politics and structure in Garlean society. And I'm like, oh, damn, like, okay. So we have a little in here. He's a little off, yeah. And he's Yotsuyu's brother. And we know that the brother from past visions was treated a little better than the sister. So he's had uh, maybe not a privileged life being a doman in the Garlean Empire, but he's seen some advancement. He is a sas, which means he's pretty far up there. He's privileged in love from his parents which is something that Yatsuyu did not have. In fact, she had the polar opposite of it, which was horrendous abuse. Yeah, and being sold off and all sorts of things like that. And, but Asahi plays the part of the diplomat so well. He becomes almost a counter Alphano in that way. And even in the final moments, after he's met with Yatsuyu and agrees that she's gone, in a sense, after you get attacked by the Red Kojin, and he helps defend the locals. Waiting on that boat, you're like, okay, all right, so the, okay, the, are things gonna be okay? And he just does that lean in, that lean in of villainy, and just spells it all out. Again, a relief to not be strung along here, to have your suspicions of anger at this creepy dude verified. And, and then we immediately tell our friends. Yeah, we don't keep it secret some stupid reason. Right, no one's like, you're a liar, or you're like, we're gonna split factions, we're gonna have Scion 1 and Scion 2, and but now we're gonna have this whole breakdown, and I'm going to the Sands, and I'm going to the Stones, and we're, we're, like, just everyone's like, yeah, this sounds okay. Warrior of Light said it. Let's do it. And particularly as a silent protagonist, it's really nice that people believe you. Because <laughs> you can't, you can't, like, choose different dialogue options, for the most part. You can't convince them. I'm really glad this game doesn't just take the easy road for drama's sake. It's it's something that really impressed me in 4.2. I think a lot of games build lore adjacent to content. And here the lore is the content and there's enough of it to go through so we can actually advance it. That's a freaking profound thought. I think the trial we do in 4.3 is a true example of lore combining with content. Before I get too far ahead, I will say, I really thought that there was going to be more to uh, Asahi saving Issei from the Red Kojin. I was, we, I think we were both convinced that like, oh, I think Asahi like paid the Red Kojin to ambush Issei so that Asahi could look like a good guy. But there was, there was none of that, especially since very shortly after that, Asahi like completely gave up the goose and, and like threatened us. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting moment. It brings back that the Red Kojin are still running amok, still committed to evil or primals or, you know, kind of whatever happened in the Ruby C is still going on there. Yeah. And, and obviously the, the red cogent, at least their artifacts come back in a really big way at the end of all of this. And so now in my head, I'm wondering, I'm like, did, did it ever, did, like, is there side dialogue? I didn't see where they talk about, Oh, the red cogent are super pissed. Cause some of their artifacts went missing. That was like some big, like, like lead into the mirror. Regardless of it being a red cogent relic, I still think it's an interesting note because it's that mirror. And she spent that time as a courtesan and where she would be doing her makeup and looking in her own face. I mean, what a great way to jog your memory than staring at your own visage, which you saw having those experiences. But if it was a primal laced artifact, maybe even inhabiting a primal like we had with Susano, then we just did something really interesting where we combined multiple kind of primal ideas, the Iceheart Phoenix riding of a primal with the Susano artifact-based Kami kind of inhabitation. Well, the big part in the beginning of 4.3 that really landed for me was somewhat comical for a hot second, which is Suyu cleaning Gosetsu, which is played for last, but it hits hard when you realize that the people that make this game bothered adding bullet scars to Gosetsu's in-game model. I mean, they'll note when you get dirty. Like, you literally get wet in your clothes in the rain. So, what are a couple bullet scars adding in there? 
More impressively is you don't get wet when you have your parasol out. That's that's even more impressive. I agree. This game is ridiculous. (laughs) We're, again, coming back after three months. New patch. We want to see how things have advanced. You're concerned about Kotsetsu. Yatsuyu's still in her childlike state taking care of Gotsetsu now and kind of a switcheroo he was taking care of her it really gives her a place in your mind and you feel like everything's gonna be okay the game even goes as far as to have her run off and end up in a village namai looking for persimmons and everything's gonna be okay why we brought her to the meeting <laughs> i understand because at that point hien hien's a good guy He saw Yotsuyu in the face of the people she had oppressed, continued to be childlike, and he said, you know what? Nothing can possibly go wrong. But he didn't expect just how crazy Asahi is. I think he'd also make an argument, too, that, like, in order for Hien to reach the point he was at in 4.2, like, emotionally, saying that, yeah, so you can stay with us. If her memory doesn't come back and this is what she wants, she can stay. He had to put some trust in Suyu to even get to that point internally so this didn't bother me this didn't that this didn't seem like uh have him make a bad decision for the sake of the plot no and you have the mirror and you have her facing not only asahi in the past but the people she straight up has oppressed and accusing her and she still doesn't know what she did wrong it seems pretty safe like what are the chances that asahi is gonna dig up villainous mom and dad like I, I mean, at this point, I'm thinking, like, I, I just kind of assume they were dead. We get a tease of the dad with that guard. Could have seemed like a, a, a side point that was more about setting up Yatsuyu. It was also foreshadowing the fact that the parents are going to freaking show up again. Like, Asahi bringing out his and Yatsuyu's parents. I think it's the single most evil thing I've seen in this game so far. And I have lived through the story of Gabu. Without a doubt, yes. Yes. Like, talking to the guard who sold her... Pretty messed up. Thank you for being voice acted game. I didn't want to read that. <laughs> because that, that's more of a streamer problem. But that is, yeah. what, listen, man, it, it might be. But guess what? We're both streaming this. And dude, I am I am with you. That was dark. I was happy that could speed by at the speed that the game was programmed to do. I don't want to have to think about what voice do I do for the man that helped sell someone into prostitution? I know I don't right. I don't want to do that. And your brain doesn't go any further because it's dark to think, well, where did he get her? Well, foster dad sold her off, of course. And for Asahi to do the mere thing and to be prepared, like we know that those boxes are all sitting around right now ready to go primal. And he's like leaning on him practically being like, hey, what's up? By the way, special surprise. Absolutely insane. He's a bastard. Such a great villain. Kyle, I don't know what it says about me. But all of this led up to me thoroughly enjoying watching Yatsuyu gut her parents, just carve them down in cold blood. There is an exact formula here. She escapes, she's gonna end it all. But she becomes interrupted by her parents' complaints, accusation, dad's lean in line, and her anger is fully justified. Like, this isn't just mustache twirling. This is revenge for her childhood. And again, we have a brief moment. We're on that precipice where things could still go back. Parents are down. She could still make the choice to pursue good, maybe even go back home to Godsetsu. But Asahi walks around the corner. It's such a perfect assault on her being to lead us to that final point. The... the train had left the station after this moment like I, I felt like the game moved at enough of a clip that i didn't really have a moment to stop and ask myself wait where is yatsuyu now like this scene ends and we're off it's like well, we gotta get we gotta get to the prisoner transfer like let's oh, go we gotta get the let's, boats and we gotta pre- repair the boats because the confederates don't take care of their damn boats get your boats ready yeah yeah that part i hate those pirates he and like floating in the water, enjoying a swim. Like these are all, it's all part of that lull. They got to, they got to work you up. You need those ups and downs. You need a palate cleanse because otherwise it's just comical how bad things get. I forgot that the pirates were after this. Never mind. The train started to leave the station. And the emergency brake was firmly applied. It's all about pacing. They got to tease you a little bit. They got to work you up for it. We've experienced so much tragedy in Final Fantasy 14. It is a game 
It is screw, the game part of it. F it doesn't matter. Irrelevant. It is a story. It is a narrative that revels in misery at times and tragedy and the climax here, the end of 4.3, the final boot dropping on exactly what Asahi's plan was. Seeing Yatsuyu march out at the top of those stairs in her full regular getup, she's got her, she's she's smoking again. It's good writing because I was just sitting there like I don't want this to be true. I was I was I I was with Hien. I looked at Suyu and I was like maybe there's a chance. No, but you still got to give Hien credit. Like he was prepared. He made us do the big boat thing because he wanted the big boat so he could get everyone away quickly because his little skiffs would take forever if things went bad, and it's not that. Asahi was just being absolutely crazy. He went crazy, yes, but he had a plan. He wanted to do the whole, oh no, they're summoning primals. Look, everybody, look, Doma's still crazy. We can't possibly be political partners with them. Everyone to the ships. Like, it was an excellent display of manipulation and politics and a good on him for it. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I like that it, the failure of it all really just comes down to him. Like, if he didn't let his emotions get the best of him, basically, would he'd still be standing. All he had to do was not walk over to his sister. That's true. Although, I mean, she did kill him with magic swords, so who knows? I don't know what the range on those magic swords are. I'd need to read a tooltip. The fight was beautiful. The transformation, just this primal in general... I'm unfamiliar with it. It doesn't look like Tsukiyomi shows up in other Final Fantasies. The character of Tsukiyomi or the figure of Tsukiyomi is a, a religious figure of Japanese and I believe Shinto origin. So it is. this is a concept that exists outside of Final Fantasy XIV, which is seemingly more and more common the more I learn about the historical background of a lot of things that Final Fantasy draws on. I, uh, I love this look of this primal, but also... What's really interesting to me about this is that it is more of a reflection of Yatsuyu than any other primal has been a reflection of the person that became the primal. I want to know more about this. Like how you were like super into everything going on with the Kalyana and the Lady of Bliss. And I was like, eh, not my favorite. This I'm so interested in the fact that Tsukiyomi looks like Yatsuyu and and even has characteristics of Yatsuyu. There's a she, there's a smoke attack. She's got a super yeah. giga pipe and she blows smoke at us in the boss fight. Absolutely. But she's got the divide down her, the black and the white, the Tsuyu and the Yatsuyu standing next to each other. The moon seems to be the influence of the object or whatever the god previously was that they're now merged with. But her anger is what's fueling it. I mean, my brain goes a number of places, a lot of them being, of course, where I came from. World of Warcraft. The Shah. Super lame compared to this. They were supposed to embody emotions, and here's Yatsuyu actually embodying the emotions that we've experienced alongside of her and her experience. Thanks to the Echo and that story device, we know many of those things, but still interesting. But really, what I love about this trial is it's free of what I'm going to call bronzebeardisms. We straight up see illusions of her past, her parents attacking her, Xenos appears, Gotsetsu defends her. That's an ad phase. That is story in mechanics. At no point does the whole battle pause while Bronzebeard runs over and I have to work the machine, everybody. And they just like explain it to us. And every time you do that fight in the future, you're gonna have to sit through those lines. You can experience this fight again and just have it be a phase. Just have it be the mechanics, the fun of it. I mean, Xenos, if he hits her, it fills her bar. Like, the way they integrated this into gameplay and the way the story built so that the gameplay could be gameplay when we got there, I'm gonna say it's genius. Like, this is just really good game design. It, yes, abs, abs so freaking lootly. It's, it's meta at the same time. I've never had a mechanic in a video game make me feel something emotionally. I was, wasn't doing Heigen dance crying because the lava represented <laughs> <laughs> some horrible tragedy in Heigen's past. It's great. It was, there were a lot of mechanics too. There's a lot of moon business and the breath attacks and everything. It was really busy. Like I immediately wanted to do this again. There's so much more to talk about, but like this, this is everything here with Yatsuyu and and just Yatsuyu's arc. 
uh, th- I, again, I like I don't I don't know where this ranks, but the same way like Osetsu's in my top three somewhere of my favorite characters in this game so far. Yatsuyu's just entire arc, in particular the ending here, is just so sad, and it really affected me. Th- this is this has got to be like a top ten moment so far in in Final Fantasy for me. I thoroughly enjoyed everything about this and Asahi was such a big part of it like I keep saying like I can't stand him I hate him he's a great character he is a wonderful villain he's like everything Xenos isn't well I guess it's not entirely true they're both hyper personal and selfish in their own unique ways there's a reason why Asahi admires Xenos and Xenos embodies the calm and collect that Asahi doesn't have and we realize that in this moment when he just shoots the shit out of Yatsuyu. Well and then and then just goes manic. Yeah, full like Joker speech. Absolutely insane. And back to balancing act. The writers here have to take in all the warriors of light that could possibly exist. All of our personal head cannons. Maybe you and I really wanted to be the ones to kill him. He, he was he was going nuts. He was off the deep end. There's a moment where you, our character as the Warrior of Light starts to walk towards him with what I like to call the Anakin stare, which is where you tilt your head down and you look you look at them past your eyebrows. Yeah, and it doesn't help that I have emo hair on my character. Uh, I imagine this landed more for me than you because I wasn't wearing shorts and a t-shirt. But <laughs> I like it. I that was. It's an adventure's wear. How did it look in this exact? Be honest. Be honest. I'm not trying like drag it through the coals or anything, but like, was there a moment where it cut that exact shot where you're like, maybe I shouldn't have worn the LL Bean collection today? No, no, I wasn't dressed up as a barista that day or wearing like the Miss Beard helm or something like that. I dress casual for adventure. It's tough out there. You gotta <laughs> wear clothes that breathe. But you're right. Like that's part of that balancing act is they give you the moment where. Our headcanon, we're going to kill him. Someone else's headcanon, you may have wanted to stop him or arrest him or something along those lines. Like he's declaring diplomatic immunity after summoning a monster that's going to cause Doma and Guard Lamal to fall apart in this whole like political ramification of him being crazy. But Yatsuyu's the one to do it and it's the perfect end because she deserves that kill. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely works. I wasn't bummed at all. Uh, if anything, it's better. It's better than if if I were to uh to ace asahi you know if this is a bioware game i would happily happily take the, take advantage Press of it that button oh 100 i'd kill asahi every time i would do another playthrough and be like this time i'm gonna make all the good guy choices nope i would just do the same thing again and then he walks in the room and he's like well everything's good here this looks great <laughs> meanwhile gosetsu is about to break down in, yeah. into an emotional puddle uh yeah that was the one time where i was like Read the room, Hien. Uh, but, you know, I, we're, the, we're a monster slayer, and Hien saw a monster, you know? And this motivates Kutsetsu back to health, basically. He's the one being taken care of, and he realizes that he's completed everything he needs here. He's done, and he can go on his pilgrimage, his quest, which I love that it puts him out in the world. Like, it's one thing for him to be retired in Hien's home. That is very plot-specific. If we ever saw a Gotsetsu again... With him out in the world, who knows? You know, he might do Astidian things. He might be running adjacent to our plot sometime. I'm just excited for him to exist. I could see him moving to a mega city and opening a tea house. A little Iroh there, yeah, I feel it. Mm, yeah, yeah. You, you got that reference. The other bit that comes up, which we already knew as players because we're watching the video game and there's scenes that Warrior of Light is not present for. Xenos, Xenos, Xenos is alive. And we have that echo connection with Asahi, where we make that confirmation. And I love it. I think there is no better way to knock Xenos down a peg than take his voice. Like, his voice was his beauty. He's still beautiful. But his (laughs) voice was so rich to have it scarred. Dude, his voice, they took his thickness. Let's get into that a little bit, because when he's standing with Dad Emperor, he's equally tall. Elidibus was shorter, but took off his mask. And we, I, I thought, we thought maybe that he was wearing Xenos' face. But you're absolutely right. The butt and the hair, the size wasn't present. It's fine. It's fine. It's just, a, it's a little, it's a, it's a meme thing that just keeps jumping into my head every time we see 
zombie Xenos. I'm just like, where's your where's your ass, man? What happened to your butt? You had some serious junk in the trunk. I like his little coat. Like I, li I like that he's so big that he <laughs> doesn't even fit in this tiny little officer's coat they gave him. Yeah. Yeah, just put it over the shoulders. It's a good look, actually. I, I rather is, like I mean, that, that costume design. Of, yeah, of, of like mending zombie Xenos and just the stylish jacket over the shoulders. Again, another great example of where they could have milked shit for needless drama and conflict because they, they people don't need to believe us as a warrior of light. I'm so glad that everyone just trusts the warrior of light's echo. They're just like, oh, you saw Xenos? Yeah, okay. Well, we believe you. Moving on. Let's go commit... Uh, well, not grave robbery. Let's just do some uh, casual exhumery <laughs> and see if there's a body in here, which leads to my favorite line Thancred has ever said. Oh, dear. We seem to be missing a corpse. I didn't know I wanted to go do this, but I'm so happy we did. It's such an obvious thing to investigate. Is the body still in the grave? No, no big mysteries. No, like, we have to go, like, we have to get the key to the crypt, and but the crypt is locked by the something. Or, like, we can just go to the grave, open up, see there's no Xenos inside. And then there's a whole nother layer. The katana-wielding soldier, which you noted before the actual hunt line came up, was Xenos. Well done. I believe I shouted that motherfucker is Xenos yeah. on stream. The, the Eastern Sword, the katana, looks so out of place. And then, uh, you know, you notice it, and then he cuts down a fellow soldier. And so with the blast, with the blast. Did it have a blast? Yeah, yeah, he did a sort of blue blast with it, which is interesting. Might not be worth reading into. Zeno Probably might have been blast. why he was raiding Magitek, the armor there, because it was a big pile of Magitek. Oh, that's an interesting thought, yeah, because he shouldn't be able to blast without his golf bag. But if he was getting something off the Magitek to empower his sword so he could blast again, maybe that's the answer for it. He was shoving batteries in the scabbard. Yeah. Just, just ether crystals or whatever. Ether batteries. I, I can I can head cannon my way around that one yeah, just that fine. Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. I mean, it could go like really off the beaten path. Like him being reborn is not a Garlemald or something like that. I'm, I'm not ready for that theory yet. Not entirely sure. It, in, right now, though, I'm thinking it would be extremely interesting if he caught up with his body. <laughs> like, because to him... This dude was so in love with himself, right? Uh, he's got to be furious that someone else is running around marionetting his corpse. Is that really what he wants to do even? Does he even care? Because his line is, Shall I use this chance to repent for my sins, embrace goodness and mediocrity? Nay, I think not. While the one I yearn to face yet lives, the hunt must go on. It sounds like he still wants to kick our ass. Like his, mm. his whole hunt, his BFF is still out there. And he wants to... <laughs> Get on another good battle. He's got another chance. How is he? I mean, I guess he used, he tried to kill us with a primal before, so he's not above using other abilities to try and ace us, right? So I guess we'll come up with some other ridiculous Batman villain <laughs> plot to kill us. If Elidibus is riding Xenos Prime, who's injured, so that suggests that that's the dead body reanimated, which Thancred is like, reanimated me alive yeah sure a dead body like he just completely hand waves and was like yeah that that can work no crystals needed we don't have any current lore mechanics to understand why xenos is outside his own body with his voice intact yeah we saw we we've seen like consciousness move between living beings all the way back with the lead into leviathan the, the, yeah the, the fish people priest he cut him down, and then his little, like, he floated over to another one of the fish people. And became himself inside that fish, man. He didn't, like, take on that body. He was now full regalia hatted. Yeah, the, but we didn't see whoever was that fish man before then get have pushed out into another body. So how right. did... The big mystery for me is how did Xenos' consciousness end up in the body of, of someone else? Was, is, is, was that a dead soldier? And, and the game hasn't even come out and said that that's Xenos, but that's Xenos. I'm calling it. I'm, this one, that is, is so clearly Xenos. But what, did he possess someone living? Was there a dead soldier nearby and he just leapfrogged? I don't, I don't know. I'm really, I'm really curious about this one. Right, and Shinryu kind of broke off him. So I don't think he still has the powers of Shinryu and that he's like primal floating about. So obvious. I mean, obviously they'll explain it. This was the big tease, but well, 
There's, there's another whole two. big tease. Yeah, there's this a whole the other big tease. The whole other big tease is, is, is Alphano out on his adventure. It gets attacked, shot down. We get to actually play as Alphano, and we meet this character that only refers to himself as the Shadow Hunter. Clearly a Garlean, has the third eye, hanging out with a bunch of other Garleans, using a gun blade. Same gun blade that Gaius had, but I th- believe that's just a standard issue gun blade. I don't no, think there's that, any. That, that is Gaius, because the X attack. He repeatedly does the same blast that he does throughout reworked Praetorium. Big waves on the ground, line up the X's, then being like, I've had run-ins with Scions. How very glib. <laughs> you know, like, he's, he doesn't do any of the words. But he's all burned. He's got all the wraps around him. Like, dude, dude like, who would hate Asians more right. than Gaius? Because such devastation was not his intention. No, no, they tricked him. And now if he's hunting them across the multiverse star business, like that sounds badass. Either way, the Shadow Hunter hunts Asians, which has its own pile of questions with it. Is he using the white Aurasite? Did he find another way to kill them? How did he kill all these Asians, and where did he find them? I think we've only seen red mask Asians. We've got Igiorm, Lahabrea, which are both taken out in Heaven's Ward's End. We've had Nabra, Nabra Sideburns, who was part of the Chrysalis and Moonbrea's death. And then there's a cutscene at the end of A Realm Reborn with Pashtarat, which we don't know anything about. He's got like cloud hair. Those are the named Asians that I'm aware of going back to my room in the book and looking for black Asian masks. And you know what I'm not going to do is Google Asians because I do not want to get no, spoiled. No. <laughs> but in that room, there's like 12 of them I could count. Are those all on our star, the source? Does each star have multiple Asians? Did Shadow Hunter kill only local Asians or is he like, is he out there traveling? Well, we know Lydibus has been traveling because we did the Warring Triad. Right, and he brought over the kid from another star. He, uh, Galaxy Brain, playing 4D chess. So I, I don't know. I don't know the significance of the three types of masks that Gaius, well, Shadow Hunter here is sporting. You've all, you're, you're really convinced. Dude, I, I, I want it to be true. That's the thing. I just really, really want this to be true. We made it to the end of Stormblood. It's the end of the point three patch. I'm assuming that just like Heaven's Ward, point four and point five are going to essentially be the prologue into Shadowbringers. There are a lot of preconceived notions. There's a cornucopia of opinions about Stormblood going in. How do you, how do you feel about it now that we're we're at the end? It's a tough question to answer right now, but I feel like we have closed the chapter on Eorzea, and it can exist without our defense. So as we enter Shadowbringers, maybe pal up with the Shadow Hunter. Maybe that's just like an Alphano subplot and we play as Alphano from time to time. We are now excused from the planet. We can now go back to hunting Asians without worrying about the political spheres or if the world's doing okay. And while Stormblood may have been slower, to get all that set up, there's not really any holes that I can think of. No, me neither. Yeah, to me, it comes down to, like, I, I get the concerns around the beginning. It is slow, but it's a really good story. And it has some of my favorite character beats of the entire game that I've experienced up until this point. And I'm glad we're not done with Xenos yet. Well, we're going to move on to point four and point five, and we still have Omega to finish up. We still have Ivalice to finish up. We still have a series of dungeons that I don't remember the name of to finish up. Oh, the Four Lords. Yeah, we still have to do the four the words. Yeah, there's a lot to do. So thanks for watching, everybody. And until next time, GG.